Father, we come to you this Lord's Day to just worship you. We thank you, Lord, for what you do and what you've given us. We thank you, Lord, that as we celebrate today the Christmas, the birth of Jesus, that, that uh, we remember the importance of it, that we have set this day aside to realize that Jesus came to die, to be born, to, be, to die for our sins, and then to rise again on that third day so we might have everlasting life with him. And so, Father, we just pray that we'll use this day to honor and glorify you and, and remember the, the true meanings behind it and that it's not about Santa Claus or all the other um, things that Satan has added to this day. And so, Father, we just pray that you bless this service, be with your servant, be with all those that are here and those that are listening online. And we just ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we get started, I'd like to wish everybody a Merry Christmas. Today, as, as we know, it's Christmas, so the title of my sermon is Miracles at the First Christmas. Now, we celebrate, celebrate Christmas as the birth of Jesus, even though we know he was really born on the Feast of Tabernacles in the fall. You know, I've preached on that. The events we will be looking at, for the most part, did not happen on the day that Jesus was born, but they all show how God was in the birth of Jesus. Now, as I said, we know this isn't the real day, but it's we have a day that's been set aside, so this is the day we use to celebrate Jesus. So, you know, these events that we're going to be looking at are all not necessarily on the day of Jesus' birth, but they're all related to it. Now, people give gifts on Christmas. But God gave the greatest gift of all in his son, Jesus. If you would, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 15. So 2 Corinthians chapter 9, and verse 15. Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. You know, that unspeakable gift, and there's other places in Scripture where it talks about the gift of God and so forth. You know, of course, that gift is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, if we did not have that gift... That God has given to us, we would still be lost in our sins and be on our way to hell. Now, the first miracle that we will look at in relation to the birth of Jesus was the Annunciation. The Annunciation was when Mary was told by the angel that she would give birth to the Messiah or Christ. The angel Gabriel appeared to a young girl, probably about 14 years old, who was a virgin and was engaged to be married to Joseph. You know, it says a spouse. That's what uh, that means. Now, the young girl's name, of course, was Mary. Mary was chosen by God to have the honor of carrying his son Jesus in the womb. This is what every Jewish girl had always desired. Mary would give birth to the God-man. Now, why God chose Mary for the honor, we will never know, but she must have been a godly girl. Let's look at some verses in Luke. So go to Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 30. So Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 30. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. Verse 28 shows Mary was highly favored by God, showing she was a godly girl. Now the verse also shows she was blessed among women. Now notice that she was blessed among women, but not above women as Roman Catholics make her. You know, she was just blessed among all the various women, but she, she was not elevated. God, Jesus never elevated her above anywhere else. You know, as I said, Jesus never elevated Mary above other women, and in fact said John the Baptist was the greatest of those born among women, and this would include Mary. Look at Luke chapter 7, verse 28. So Luke chapter 7, verse 28. You know, he did talk about the prophets, but still, you know, he was, uh, he was trying to show the importance of John the Baptist, but yet, you know, he never, you know, Mary was never elevated. We're going to look at just a couple examples to show this. 
So Luke chapter 7, verse 28. For I say unto you, among those that are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist, but he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Now, of course, Mary was also born of a woman. So Now, another woman tried to elevate Mary, but Jesus rebuked her. This was during his ministry. Look at Luke chapter 11, verses 27 through 28. So Luke chapter 11, verses 27 through 28. And it came to pass, as he spake these things, a certain woman of the company lifted up her voice and said unto him, Blessed is the womb that bare thee, and the paps which thou hast sucked. But he said, Yea, rather blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. You know, so, so you know, there's, we see right there, he wasn't, he was saying that Mary's no more, just because she gave birth to me, you know, she's no better than, you know, anybody else or something. You know, like I said, you know, we do need to re respect her that she was a godly woman, but we don't sit there and elevate her the way the Roman Catholics do. Now, the announcement of the coming birth of Jesus as Christ was so important, so important that God sent an angel to make the announcement. You know, as I said, he had sent Gabriel, the angel Gabriel, to do, make this announcement. You know, so we'll see all these miracles that start happening. You know, it's not normal for people to have an angel come to them. You know, there's angels around us and so forth, but we do not see them. We don't know they're there, you know, and so forth. But, you know, this was an angel that literally she saw and talked to. Now, the next miracle was the conception of Jesus, which was clearly a miraculous event. Mary was a young virgin girl who became with child while remaining a virgin. Jesus was miraculously conceived in Mary by God, the Holy Ghost, which is why Jesus is the Son of God. Now, Jesus became the Son of God at the conception as a man. As God, Jesus has always existed, and he was equal with God the Father and the Holy Ghost. We're going to look at a couple of verses in Luke, but you know, everybody always says that, that uh, Jesus has always been the son, of, the son of God. That's not true. Jesus has always been God. But he was not always been the son of God. He became the son of God at the, the birth, you know, at when he became a man at his birth. You know, he was the son of God because God the Holy Ghost gave birth to him through Mary. So therefore, he's the son of God. It's the Holy Ghost, as we know, just as much as Jesus and God the Father are all one and part of that Godhead. You know, so that's why he's son of God. If he was always the Son of God, then he would never be, he cannot be equal with God the Father. You cannot be equal if you're the Son. Look at, you know, plus, and in, in, in it also usually you to have to have a son, then you'd have to have come around after the Father. So, you know, people teach that all the time, but I do not agree with that. But, you know, I believe he became the Son of God at, when he became, you know, his birth as Jesus is the God man. Let's look at Luke chapter 1, verse 31. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. And then go down to verses 34 and 35 of Luke chapter 1. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing in the power of the high oh, 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 sorry, sorry. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And then go to verse 37. For with God nothing shall be impossible. You know, with God it's no big deal to have a virgin birth. You know, that nothing is impossible with God. Now this great miracle had been predicted in the Old Testament. You know, it's Christmas time, a lot of times on, on Christmas cards and so forth. You know, everybody knows this verse. But let's look at Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. So Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. I mean, it's, in, it's very important because, you know, a lot of these, some modern Bibles or their footnotes or whatever, they'll say a young woman and so forth. No, this was clearly Mary was a virgin, and it's important she had to be a virgin. If she was not a virgin, Jesus would have been born with a sin nature just like all of us, and he would have needed a Savior for himself. So look at Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now as I said, the virgin birth is essential, as this allowed Jesus to be born a man, but without the sin nature of man from Adam. 
You know, we know that this, the sin nature is passed down from the dad. It's not passed down from the mom. That's why he could still have the be of, of a person through Mary, but he could not have, you know, the sin nature is not passed down through the mom. It's passed down through the dad. So, you know, that's why, but he had God, he had God the Holy Ghost as his dad. So therefore he had no sin, but yet he could still be born a natural birth in that sense, you know, through the womb of a mom, just like any other man ever has been. And as I said, without the miracle of the virgin birth, we would still be dead in our sins. You know, and unfortunately, you know, there's people that profess to be Christians and they're pastors and so forth, and they teach that, you know, the, world, the virgin birth was not true or it's not necessary, and this and that. Again, it is very important. This is the most important thing. If he was not born of a virgin, he would have been born with that sin nature, just like us, and he would have needed a Savior, and we would still be dead in our sins, and we'd be on a path to hell when we die. You know, so people that deny the virgin birth are not true Christians. You cannot be saved and not believe in the, in the virgin birth. It's just that simple. Now, <clears throat> Jesus as God became flesh and became a man while still remaining God. Jesus was 100% God and 100% man. You know, once he became, you know, he was born at this, in, as a man... He never lost his deity. You know what people say? Well, he put it aside. No, he still remained 100% God during that time. He just did not use those powers, you know, as, as a rule and so forth. But you know, he was still 100% God, and what, but he was also 100% man. You know, there's some things we just do not understand. We will not understand until we get to heaven. But you know, that's exactly what happened. Now, God had prepared a body for Jesus in the womb of Mary. Look at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5. You know, we see that God had prepared this body for him. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared for me. <coughs> and then look at John chapter 1, verse 14. John chapter 1, and verse 14. We know that the word is Jesus from other places and so forth. First John chapter 5, verse 7 and so forth. And John chapter 1, 1 through 3. But John chapter 1, verse 14. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, we refer to Jesus becoming a man as the incarnation, which means being clothed with flesh. You know, that's what it says. He came, you know, the Word was made flesh. You know, he was not always his flesh. You know, like I said, he was, you know, we saw in Hebrews, he had this God prepared this body for him. You know, God is spirit. Now, you know, that doesn't mean that people still don't have a body. Angels have bodies. They just have spiritual bodies. You know, people think they're just like these little ghosts just floating around. No, they still have bodies, just not a physical body in the sense that, like, we have this body with, with flesh and bones. You know, that's what Jesus talked about later on, that, you know, spirits do not have bodies of flesh and bones. You know, they're, they're spiritual bodies. You know, that's why they can go through walls and so forth like that. But, but now Jesus took on the nature of a man so that he could one day die for the sins of mankind and then rise from the grave on the third day so that people could have everlasting life if they accepted him as Savior. Go back to Hebrews, look at Hebrews chapter 2, verse 16. So Hebrews chapter 2, verse 16. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Of course, we know he was the son of David, which came from Abraham and so forth. But this is why there's no salvation for angels, the angels that rebelled in sin, because he did not take on the nature of angels. He did not become an angel to bring salvation to them. He brought salvation to man by becoming a man. Now, the next miracle connected with Christmas is how the angel Gabriel came to Joseph, and the few, uh, came to Joseph, who was the future husband of Mary, to explain that Mary was with child of the Holy Ghost and not by some man. You know, Mary had not committed adultery. You know, Mary, Joseph had heard about this, and he assumed that she would committed adultery. But yet again, we say, God sends another angel as a miraculous event to warn Joseph, saying, no, what, what she had, you know, is, it's, it's from God. 
that you know you could still take her as your wife. She's not corrupted. She did not commit adultery and so forth. So, you know, we, we see these miracles that, that you know, J Joseph would have never known otherwise. He'd been like, well, you know, how do you all of a sudden have this child? But look at Matthew chapter 1, verses 20 through 23. So Matthew chapter 1, verses 20 through 23. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. You know, of course, as I said, that shows you right there too that, you know, God, Jesus, we saw there in John 1, 14, that Jesus took on the flesh of a man. He became flesh. But he was still God, 100% God. That's why he was God with us. If he had lost his deity, he would not be God with us. He would just be some man. Now, the next miracle was how God had started to prepare the hearts of the Jewish people to be looking for the Messiah. Now, next God had the Roman government conduct a census in order to ensure that Mary would be in Bethlehem when Jesus was born in order to fulfill prophecy, clearly showing that God is in control of everything and thinks of everything. Go back to Luke, look at cha uh, chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. So Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. You know, we often think that, well, these things just randomly happen. Oh, it's a coincidence you hear people always saying. No, there's no such thing as coincidences that, that God allowed this to happen because he's in control of everything. You know, that he makes sure that the prophecy gets fulfilled. So look at Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree, that means a law, from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. You know, God had that the Romans formed the census that way then Mary could be make sure she got back to Bethlehem and then Jesus could be born in Bethlehem. Otherwise she would not have been born there. She wouldn't have been born, you know, there in Nazareth. Now Jesus was born exactly in the town that God said he would be about seven hundred years earlier. As I said, God made sure that just like he predicted, he'd be born there in Bethlehem. Go to Micah chapter 5, verse 2. So Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. This predicted, this was written about 700 years earlier, showing how God, you know, for him, time means nothing. He knows the future, and he was very much in control, and he makes sure that prophecy is fulfilled. So Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. Okay, Micah chapter 5, verse 2. But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrata, Though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. And notice that he shows, he says it's Bethlehem and Frat. He tells you the specific Bethlehem because there was more than one Bethlehem in Israel. And, you know, just like, you know, we have in the United States today, you have different towns that are, that are uh, you know, different states have the same town. But, you know, so he's telling you, you know, exactly even which Bethlehem it was. So it wasn't even like, well, you know, he just happened to be born in Bethlehem. We have, you know, 20 of them here. So, you know, he's telling you that even the exact one that he would be born in. You know, it's just like you have a Jackson, Missouri, Jackson, Mississippi, Jackson, Tennessee, and so forth like that. Well, it's the same thing. They had these different Bethlehems. So he's telling you exactly which one it was. Now, at the birth of Jesus, God sent angels to shepherds out in the field to announce his birth that they were to announce to the world. God made sure that people knew of the birth of his son. And God went to what were considered low-class people to announce the birth of his son. You know, shepherds were not highly thought of. Go to, go to Luke chapter 2 there in uh, verses 8 through 11. But 
you know, notice God didn't go to like the rich kings or some high and mighty or the Pharisees or something like that. He went to these, so what you know, were said to be lowly shepherds out in the field because you know those are the ones that that are going to listen to God. You know, they're the ones that, that care. So Luke chapter two verses eight through eleven. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Now Jesus as God was born in a manger, showing his humble beginning as a man. Go to Luke chapter 2, the next verse. Uh, verse 12. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. So we see God, you know, has, goes to, you know, sends an angel to these shepherds, these lowly men. But then he also, you know, his, his, his son was born in a manger. He wasn't even born in some fancy, you know, whatever accommodations they had at that time and so forth, you know, what, something like what would a king have been born in? You know, he, he was born in a manger. You know, manger, for what people don't know, that's like the big trough thing that, that animals, you know, cows and horses and things like that eat out of. But we see one more miracle in connection with the birth of Jesus on this first Christmas. This was the miracle of the wise men who brought gifts to Jesus and worshipped him when he was about two years old. They followed the star, which we call the Star of Bethlehem. At the time of the birth of Jesus, God had his star appear in the east that these wise men saw and followed to the home of Jesus when he was about two years old. The wise men had been looking for the sign of the birth of the Messiah, so they saw the star and recognized that it was a sign from God. Remember I said he was getting people's hearts preparing them for this time, not only the Jews, but like even these wise men, which you know may have been partly Jewish or whatever, but they... Uh, you know, their, people's hearts were starting to get, you know, even before the birth, God was preparing their, their hearts. Now, this star led them to Jesus, and it seems it may have taken them about two years to get there. You know, there's, you can see my sermon, but we know that they were there, you know, they were not there at the birth. They were there actually about two years later, but, you know, it, it seems that this star appeared on that night, and then, like I said, it took them about two years or whatever to get there, but... You know, this shows dedication and the fact that these wise men recognized that Jesus as the Messiah was God and worthy of worship. You know, they are rightly called wise men. You know, people try to call them magi and all this other stuff. No, you go to what the King James Bible says. They're wise men. They're wise because they understood that Jesus was worthy to be worshipped. And they were willing to make this, this travel, this distance, and this time and so forth to get there. Let's go and look at Matthew chapter 2, verse 1. So keep your finger there in Luke, so we're going back there. But Matthew chapter 2 and verse 1. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. And then go down to verse 11. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. Now the star that guided the wise men to Jesus was no ordinary star, but yet one more miracle connected with this first Christmas. You know, you can listen to my sermon on the star of Bethlehem, you know, more on this or whatever, but, you know, again, this was not just some ordinary star like people claim or whatever, or a conjunction of planets or something, Jupiter or whatever. That, you know, this was another miracle of God. But it seems that, you know, there in Matthew chapter 2, verse 1, that, you know, it says when Jesus was born, then, you know, that was when the wise men started heading, heading east. So it seems like that star appeared when he was born. So it took him basically, you know, these two years. You know, we know if you read on it, he was, you know, it says, you know, right here in verse 11, you know, when he you know, came into the house. Well, so obviously, you know, we just said he was born in a manger, so we know he was in a house. And it says he was a young child, so... And like I said, then he goes on to try to kill children under two years old. So we know he was basically about two years old when he got there. But it all is related to back to that birth of Jesus for that first Christmas. Now many more miracles occurred within the two years of Jesus' birth, such as when Simeon was told by the Holy Ghost that he would see Christ before he died. And he did when he saw Jesus at the temple 
when Jesus was brought to be circumcised eight days after his birth. So let's go back to Luke. Look at Luke chapter 2, verses 25 through 26. So Luke chapter 2, verses 25 through 26. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And if you read on, then you know you see he got the whole Jesus and so forth as a as a the infant there, the little baby. So he did get to see him. You know, and then of course it talks about Anna the prophetess, you know, who was old and so forth, been a widow for eighty four years and whatnot. So we see, you know, those things again. They're still part of that birth, and so in that sense, you know. And then we also see um, there in Ma go back in Matthew uh, chapter two, verse thirteen. Because following the departure of the wise men, Joseph had an angel tell him to move his family with Jesus to Egypt to escape the wrath of King Herod. So the wise men come, and then you know an angel tells them that you know tells Joseph that. The, you know, the wise men have to go, they're going back another way, and, and Joseph needs to get out of there. An angel had come to, to the wise men as well, telling them that, that Herod was wicked. So, you know, they go off to, to uh, Egypt. So we see another miracle connected with this, and that, that um, Jesus, God sends another angel. So look at Matthew chapter 2, verse 13. It's Matthew chapter 2, verse 13. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeareth to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother, and flee into Egypt. And be thou there until I bring thee word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. And again, we, we keep being referred to as a young child. Or, you know, all the weird places, you know, it'd be a baby or a babe or something like that. So we know, again, he was not this newborn. He was, you know, around two years old. Now, because of the miracle of that first Christmas and, and what the birth of Jesus means... It has influenced other miracles on Christmas. One such miracle occurred on Christmas in 1914 during World War I. The nations had been involved in a brutal and bloody war since the end of July, yet they would stop on Christmas and celebrate Christmas together. You know, this war would go on to, to millions and millions of people would end up dying in this war. But on this first Christmas there in that war, then... Uh, what became known as the Christmas truce, these troops would stop and they celebrated uh, this truce and had Christmas. You know, this truce was not declared by politicians or military leaders, but rather seems to have come from God. The Germans were in trenches on one side with the British, Belgian, and French in trenches on the other side. You know, and in some places, depending on where they're at, they were more than 100 yards away. That, they Literally, you could hear the people in the other trenches or smell their food when they were cooking or doing whatever, you know, so if they were talking, you know, you could hear people and things like that. And, you know, of course, they were discouraged to have any fraternization with the enemy. But the, um, you know, it's been said that some German troops decided on their own to start to sing Christmas carols and eventually came out of the trenches without weapons and started towards the Allies. You know, supposedly when they start singing these Christmas carols, then the, the British start singing one of their own, and then they, the Germans would sing one, and you know, and then finally they both ended up supposedly, you know, there's different stories, and you know, this this line went on for miles and miles, and you know, it wasn't, you know, exactly the same story everywhere, but they, uh, you know, supposedly eventually they had sung one that they both sung, that, uh, I forgot which one it was, but you know, they both like knew that same hymn or whatever. And, but eventually the, the Germans came out of the trenches and they did not bring any weapons. And at first the, the Allies were weary, thinking, okay, this is a trap, they're coming after us. But then when they realized they had no weapons, then they came out as well. And then they, meet, they, they met them in the middle of a, you know, the no man's land, as it was known as, you know, between the two trenches. Because basically normally if you came out and tried to get out of those trenches, you'd be just get mowed down and, you know, you'd be killed. But, you know, they got out together and they started singing. You know, the Germans, you know, I said, the Germans and the British were all singing along together, singing these hymns. And they met in the middle of the battlefield and shook hands. And it has been said they exchanged cigarettes, food, hats, and buttons, and, you know, so forth. Obviously, you know, they're in the middle of combat here. They didn't have, 
you know, a big Christmas meal or they didn't have, you know, like different things, but, you know, they had a little thing like, hey, here's a little button or, you know, what, what are things, little things they can exchange of, you know, their, their clothing, something's a little different or whatever they had. And, but the truce also allowed for each side to bury their dead, which had lain in the battlefield for a long time. As I said, most of the time, the people, they come out, they would get mowed down with machine guns and so forth. They were killed. They could not, they would have to leave their dead there because if somebody out to try to get them, they'd be getting killed too. So, you know, these bodies have been laying there for a long time, you know, been lying there for you know, a long time. And then this truce allowed them to bury a bunch of them. Now, it has been estimated that about 100,000 men took part in this truce and that some even played some games of soccer on the battlefield. Now, again, they didn't have a real soccer ball, so they, you know, it said that they just used some kind of something that they, Improvised and it wasn't like you know organized games. They just you know whatever. But this miracle only happened because the men understood the important event that had happened back on that first Christmas. You know, and again, these were the, the men themselves took this upon themselves. It was not the generals. It was not the politicians or anybody else. It was the little little grunts, the soldiers right there in, in the. Uh, in the trenches, they said, you know, it's Christmas, it's enough's enough. We're not going to, you know, be part of this. So, But many other miracles have occurred on Christmas, more than on any other days, and I do not believe this is a coincidence. You know, you could read over and over about stories of people that certain things happen. You know, this, this child, something happens to it, and then some miracle happens where this child miraculously is, Something, you know, whatever, you know, so either a cure or somebody's found or whatever it may be. You know, there's always, you hear about these stories that seem to happen on Christmas and, you know, far more often than other times. You know, as I said, I do not believe in coincidences. You know, God's always in control of everything. Now, in, in closing, the birth of Jesus at this first Christmas was clearly miraculous from the various announcements by angels to the virgin birth of Jesus to how Jesus as God became flesh as a man to a star guiding the wise men. Thank God for these miracles at this first Christmas so that Jesus could become a man born without sin due to the virgin birth and later take on the sins of the world so that he could die for all of us and take our place so that we might live forever with him. Jesus was born to die. You know, we need to remember that. You know, Jesus, his whole purpose to be born was to die. You know, the rest of us, you know, that's not... You know, we, we will die because of sin, but we're not born to die. Jesus was specifically born to die. He knew from the moment he was born, you know, all his life, he knew that one day he would have to give his life for all of us so that we might have, you know, everlasting life, that he would have to take on that sin of the world. But Jesus took on sin so we could live when he had no sin. You know, we know that Jesus had no sin, and... But he took on that sin so that we could live and have everlasting life if we so chose him. But yet he himself would have to die, even though he had no sin. Remember, death comes about because of sin. You know, that's why he could die, because he had taken on the sins of the world. But let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. So 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He took our place on that cross 33 years after his birth. Let us praise God for the miracles of Christmas, and if you are not saved, please call upon Jesus today to be your Savior. What better day than on Christmas? You know, so I do plead that if you're, if you're not saved, you know, call upon Jesus today to get saved because... You know, there's there's never a better day. You know, you never know if you have it tomorrow. There's no better day than to, to get saved and have your be born again, have your new birth on the same day that we celebrate the birth of Jesus. That there's no better day to be saved than today on Christmas. Let's have a word of prayer. So, Father, we thank you for this time you've given us here to, this morning to just study and worship Jesus as we celebrate Christmas. That. We, we see the miracles that God provided for uh, uh, on that first Christmas, you know, start and prepare for that day as well as on that actual day and then continued even on after that. 
And we know, as I said, we know that even today, many miracles continue to happen on Christmas. And so, Father, as I said, we know that, that today is not necessarily the real day that Jesus was born, but yet it's the day we have set aside to worship him. And so, Father, we just we remember that Jesus came born to die, that it's very important that we understand that, that he took upon the sins of, of not only of us, but the whole world. That because he loved us so much, he loved us before we ever loved him, then we are able to be saved if we so choose him as our Savior and spend everlasting life with him in heaven, and here on earth in the New Jerusalem. And so, Father, we just thank you that you gave us the unspeakable gift in your son Jesus, that it was the greatest gift of all. You know, we always, people complain that they, you know, did not get any gifts or this or that. Well, they don't need to worry about getting gifts from somebody else because it's not their birthday. It was the day we celebrate Jesus. And that you don't need any other gift. that you, ha you can receive the greatest gift of all by asking Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. And so, Father, we do thank you for what you've done for us. And we just ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.